but here is an important section. So when I first started uh, this novel, I knew that there was a, a particular family story that I did want to include. The rest of it's fiction. And this was a story I heard uh, many times as a child. And as a child, it really seemed unbelievable to me. But over time, I have learned that this, this really is something that might have happened. And you'll, you'll notice in a moment. Mary's way of yeah. That's right. That's right. It happened in our own house. We, we can talk about that later. Similar, similar situation. So uh, uh, Guido's grandmother, uh, Donna Maria Giustina, is a very important figure in the early part of the novel because he's devoted to her. He takes care of her. She has the gift uh, which uh, Guido and his uh, beloved uh, cousin uh, Tina have inherited from her. They're both uh, clairvoyant and psychic. It causes them both problems in life, as such a gift can do. And Nonna is, uh, which means grandmother in Italian, is really quite an important figure early on. So there's a long scene where it is her 69th birthday in the month of May, and this is just before the resort season opens up for the summer. So, so she decides she wants to have a big birthday party. And uh, she invites various people to come to it, and most especially uh, her special friend, uh, Ernesto Caballo. <laughs> Mr. Caballo has entered the room. Uh, I mean, could they possibly have been lovers? Could they possibly have known each other before his grandmother met his grandfather? It just blows his mind to imagine this. But everybody loves Signor Caballo. And he is certainly a, an idol and uh, the model of uh, an Italian gentleman for Guido. So he's there that night at this birthday party, and they're all telling stories. I've heard that Signor Caballo had a wife and daughter who perished in Italy as the result of a fire that began in his pharmacy, and that blaming himself, he charged into the First World War seeking oblivion. I have heard people say that nowadays he's involved with someone in New York, and that he also has a woman in Verona. And I myself have noted that whatever his age, he still looks fit for battle as a cavaliere and handsome as a movie star. His silvery hair is long and combed straight back with brilliantine. He wears a mustache and short beard, una barbetta, whose contours I have watched him shape with the light strokes of his straight razor, a splendid tool with an ivory handle. I have just begun to shave, and my father has given me for Christmas a hefty metal safety razor with a faceted handle. However, it's the blade of Caballo that I covet. Many are the gifts that he has brought to our home. I remember my grandmother clapping her hands like a child when he unloaded from his green Buick packages of imported cheese and biscotti. To my mother, he regularly brings fashion magazines from Italy and recently a bolt of lavender silk. Besides art books, to me, he has given a tiny ship complete with sails carved from buffalo horn and a nugget of yellow stone I had presumed to be fool's gold, but which he informed me was sulfur, taken straight from the womb of the earth. Caballo is speaking now of the opera Tosca, of her fatal beauty, of the fatal beauty at its heart, of Tosca's fire and magnetic personality, of passion that seeks to surpass all limitations, of Tosca's ultimate triumph. Having destroyed the tyrant Scarpia, she leaps from the walls of the Castel Sant'Angelo to be reunited in death with her lover, Cavaradossi. Thus, Signor Caballo pronounces, her beauty and their love become deathless. Now my mother speaks. At the villa, our business has always been pleasure, she says gaily, introducing a bottle of cognac to the table. Although this night belongs to Nona, still it has been born through my mother's efforts. At, at the restaurant we must, my mother always insists, pay attention to details, and she is the exemplar of this practice, of which her mother is so evidently proud that her eyes are moistened. White candlesticks and silver holders, my mother Anna insists, and yet the daughter of Maria and Antonio Giostavera is hardly an aristocrat. One to a table unless more than a party of four. Practical she is. 
Although for tonight's occasion we dine by the light of several branching candelabra, and die myself have, that I myself have arranged on the long tabletop. We don't know. We don't smart, she says, beaming at me. Candlelight is important, I agree, nodding my head, a little tipsy from my first sips of cognac. To be allowed alcohol at the dinner table is not without precedent. However, tonight is special in so many ways, it seems that I am being invited into the grown-ups' conversation. Although I certainly agree that pleasure is a fine livelihood, I see also how rarely my parents actually enjoy themselves at the villa. My mother knows what it means to be in the hospitality business, and she claims she understands what the public wants, which is why I've so often heard her exhorting my father to put on some personality for our customers. He can be very charming, warm and funny, although he depends on whiskey and soda to meet many of her demands. I have come to believe they were happier together in the days before I was born. No one has told me this, but I believe. None that takes an interest in my parents' affairs, but mostly she keeps her eye on me. I'm intent on pleasing her, and because I try to be perfect, I hate making mistakes. I am not conceited, although I've been accused of this by certain kids in school due to my natural aloofness. Watchful of others, I am also secretive, and certainly numbness manner with me has helped instill the notion that I have inherited some special power from her. Bending this way and that through time, our family history is recalled around the table. It has the lulling effect of a fairy tale for me and incites dreamy visions of a past I wish I had lived. Nanda recounts my father's first visit to the Vila Jostoveda with happy approval, for she, above all others, loves his genuine talent for comedia. Now he has married my mother, and then I am born. When I'm five, before I start school, my mother and father and I make a lengthy visit to Italy. Sitting across the table from me now, my father gestures with both hands by his cheek, and his eyes shine with the candlelight, but I'm not a little boy. I sit up immediately and drink from my tiny glass of cognac. I keep my eyes fixed on Nonna and Cabal. I have no intention of following my younger cousin Tina from the dining room. At 11 years of age, Moody Tina has not allowed the same freedoms as Cristiano and I, although she has indulged in many other ways. The baby of the family, the surprise, the darling. My mother has told me more than once that her father is spoiling her and that Uncle Tony is also too lax with Cristiano, who she says needs a firm hand to guide him. Usually, Chris has his own plan especially now that he has a car, but tonight he wants to stay at the dinner table and hear the old stories, and this makes me very happy. As far as I'm concerned, the evening won't be complete without the tale of the lightning, and it's this my grandmother now commences. We were sitting here, in this room, she says, finishing our meal, just like this. The thunder was so loud as it approached, Japina, do you remember her with her wild eyes and raven hair? Japina had just cleared the table when suddenly the house shook terribly. Falling glass shattered and silver knives rattled in the drawers. The girl dropped her tray, which was loaded with dishes, right here, right on the floor next to your chair, Tony. And then, as if shot, she fell to her knees. Nona points to the ground. When I look, I see the black-haired girl who takes on for me the dark and deathless beauty of Tosca stunned on her knees amid shards of white china. Is she hurt? My grandmother continues the tale. Maybe there were several cracks of thunder. And then, like a cannonball, it came at last into the room. She throws her arms wide. Her eyes track the ball of lightning through the air overhead. Taking his cue, Mr. Cavallo rumbles the tabletop with two fists. Our plates and glasses tremble. Era la forza del destino! He intones with mock gravity. He casts a look at Nana, who is also smiling to recall the extraordinary night. This took place before I was born, and over the years of my childhood, I have heard various accounts of the blasting thunder and the fireball that seared the air as it flew through the long dining room, although it is always to Nana's version of the story that everyone defers. Così strano, così straordinario, she says, stroking the flesh of her left ear 
where an ornament of white gold quivers. I think it's like a tiny chandelier. I think that in Milan, all the women wear such jewels, which must be why my grandfather's eyes have lights in them, looking at his high-born lady. His hands, big butcher's hands that he washes carefully like a surgeon's rest on the table before him as he listens. The electric went out, and the candle flames flew off into the darkness. The windows were open, you see. It had been so hot. Non si poteva respirare. We wanted rain. We wanted a cool wind. We had prayed for rain, and then it came. I say it was not a bad thing, that tempest and its miraculous bolt from beyond. Nanda glances at my father, but he's gazing at his empty wine glass, tapping it with his fingers, his thoughts apparently elsewhere. Then it was suddenly cold, colder than you would like sitting here tonight, believe me. The chill ran up the women's dresses and bit their thighs. She pinches her own face like a naughty schoolgirl. She often says things like that, and my grandfather lowers his eyes while everyone else laughs. My father, too, and even Manaperta amid his cloud of cigarette smoke. So cold that I grabbed myself. Nino was far from me, you see, at the opposite end of the table, and I sat frozen like this. She laces her arms across her bosom and grows completely still. A breathing statue she's become with dazzling gray eyes. Old Tommy Lupo is transfixed, and his moon-faced wife, Lena, seems quite dumbfounded by Nonna's sudden, intense silence. Then, Sitting at my right was La Signora Dolcepana, may she rest in peace. On my left that night was her skinny little boy, Powell, the one who became a police chief in the Bronx. That night he cried, Mama! And when his mother reached for him, he flew beneath the table to nestle in her skirts like a baby bird. Next, we heard a great sigh, un suspiro grande, as if something long in prison had been let loose. Isn't that right, Nino? My grandfather nods. Nonna leans forward on both hands to address us. If you've ever sat with the dying, she leans back and crosses herself. You know how much one sigh can mean. At such a moment, the condition of your own soul might be called into question. The lightning had not come through one of the open windows, she says abruptly, looking around at everyone. You remember? The windows were open. But it crashed through the wall like a shooting star. It burst into our midst with its blue and white fire like a bridal gown trailing. Yet, it did not hurry. It made its stately way about the central pillars of this room, illuminating everything. I sat completely still, expecting I knew not what from the hand of God. Incredibly, without so much as touching a candle wick, it finally flew out through the same opening by which it had come. There, exactly there. She points to the wall with x-ray vision. I see the ancient hole behind the plaster. That extraordinary moment passed, and sitting stunned in the darkness, we could hear the rain falling outside, the storm rumbling distantly, like a battle far off. We stirred awake, and then Ernesto, you leapt to your feet and ran to the window and signaled all clear. She takes a quick whiff of the air. I can still smell the electricity. And perhaps there is something else. Fear, perhaps. Her voice whispers away into silence. Ancora, ancora di più. All right, all right. 